Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank, you. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We are honored to celebrate the life and the work of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Nemours. St. Julie Billiard proclaimed, how good is the good God? And in every action and way, the sisters on our panel today demonstrate the goodness of grace and perseverance in times of joy and times of struggle. The seven hallmarks of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Nemours define their wisdom in the world. They are educators in the classroom and in life, continuously serving all in God's name and demonstrating the call to action rooted in social justice. We are privileged today to have three sisters on our panel, Sister Mary Farron, Sister Rosemary Reynolds, and Sister Mary Alice McCabe to celebrate Founders Week. The wealth of experience on this panel is tremendous, and I would like to take this opportunity to speak about their journeys. Sister Rosemary Reynolds, SND Dana Moore, received her bachelor's degree from Sacred Heart University, Fairfield, Connecticut, and her master's and sixth year certificate in school counseling from Southern Connecticut State University. She currently ministers at Albertus Mag Magnus College, which we will not hold her against her, in New Haven, <laughs> Connecticut, as associate director of the Career and Professional Development Office. As a career counselor, she works directly with students providing internship support, career workshops, and sophomore professional development classes. Prior to Albertus, Rosemary served as director of school counseling at several Connecticut high schools. Sister Rosemary is currently a member of the Board of Trustees for Trinity Washington University. Within the congregation, Rosemary serves as a member of the Ministry of Invitation and is part of the team planning our Sisters of Notre Dame High School Student Leadership Conference scheduled for June here at Emmanuel. Sister Mary Farron, Sister of Notre Dame de Nemours, class of 1969. Following graduation from Emmanuel as a math major in 1969, Sister Mary Farron, Sister of Notre Dame, went on to Brown University for a master's in teaching math before entering the Sisters of Notre Dame de Nemours in 1970. Sister Mary began life in ministry as a high school math and physics teacher and then quickly moved into various administration positions. After completing a master's program at the University of Notre Dame's business school in the administration of not-for-profit institutions, she served for over 20 years as a high school principal. Sister has served on several pro province leadership teams and most recently has helped five provinces to merge into one, stretching from New England to California. Sister Mary has served and continues to serve on numerous boards, including Emmanuel's Board of Trustees. Sister Mary Alice McCabe. Sister Mary Alice McCabe, Sister of Notre Dame, worked as a community organizer with rural landless communities in Northeastern Brazil for over 30 years accompanying three generations as they struggled for land rights. In Nicaragua, she accompanied rural women cooperatives for five years. On returning to the United States, Mary Alice, along with 34 Sisters of Notre Dame de Nemours, volunteered during two years at the southern border of Texas in the Matamoros MX immigrant camp, where they welcomed thousands of immigrant families seeking asylum in the United States. She is currently collaborating with other sisters and volunteers at the Immigrant Welcome Center in Phoenix, Arizona, welcoming immigrants and refugee families from around the world. She is the author of two books, Our Struggle Was a Sacred Str Struggle, The People of Macao, a base Christian community in Northeastern Brazil, tell the story of their struggle for the land. History in Our Hands, Rural Women in Northeastern Brazil, tell how they awakened to their human rights as women. We thank you all for being here today and we are honored to be in your presence. So we're going to ask you to explain about your work and how it relates to our students, staff and faculty at Emmanuel. Sister Rosemary, would you mind beginning? I'm going to just say that the topic I was given was to talk about prayer and spirituality within the Sisters of Notre Dame. 
So let's just take a moment to breathe in the goodness of God. And now let us release that breath of our good God into our community. When Kathleen asked me to speak today, I was hesitant, but I knew I couldn't say no to her. After all, it was our Founders Day. And so here I am sharing on the prayer and spirituality of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur. I am sure some of you have similar experiences around prayer. Praying for a parking space, in my <laughs> mind, anything that has to do with the Blessed Virgin helps a lot. <laughs> um, praying for the Red Sox to beat the Yankees. I'm from New Haven, it's cutthroat down there. <laughs> and of course, maybe we will finally get that snow day. But today we are here to reflect on the relationship each one of us has with our good God. And no matter what you think or believe, there is a relationship there. I, you, just need to be attentive to the signs and experiences of each day. For me, my grandmother demonstrated to my family her reliance on God. She would rise early in the morning and find a quiet place, and out would come the envelope. In the envelope, was filled with prayer cards for those who had died, novenas, and for particular causes. She would repeat this again in the evening. She was breathing in the goodness of God. My grandmother also saw the need to be, those, to be there for those in need. She was involved in our local parish. She nursed neighbors back to health and always offered each one of us love with no strings attached. She was breathing out the goodness of God. When she died, our worry was, who was gonna do all the prayers? <laughs> who would become the prayer person in the family? Not because I'm a nun, I could do this. <laughs> and so in the end, we all took it on. Each one of us was assigned a prayer or a prayer card to say each day to keep it going. <clears throat> I imagine Julie was similar in her actions, always finding ways and space to talk to her God. I can't imagine what it must have been like to be an invalid for 22 years, paralyzed, and at times unable to speak. Trust me, I've had laryngitis for a week. <laughs> it isn't pretty, except for the people you live with who are very happy. <laughs> Yet, her reliance on God through these difficult times was essential for her. She never gave up or gave in to the situation. Julie proclaimed, the more difficult the times are, the more we must expect and hope everything from the goodness of the good God. And at another time, when the good God calls us to a place, his goodness gives us what we need. Prayer, just like any other relationship, at times can stress, stretch us, challenge us, and love us into being, breathing in the goodness of God. Julie was a great example that prayer is a conversation which requires talking and listening, and sometimes just resting in the Lord. That's not always easy. We can, we can become impatient and frustrated, but remember, God is there just waiting for us. Henry Nowen refers to this experience. I see not only that we are yearning to belong to God, but that God is also yearning to belong to us. This experience of prayer is mutual, a relationship, a connection between us and God. But prayer is not only an experience of quiet time or reflection. Julie recognized that she needed to share her experience of our good God and share she did, beginning numerous schools in France and then moving on to Belgium. Today, we strive to continue that mission of goodness through our work in schools, learning centers, spirituality centers, 
and healthcare facilities. Mary Alice will talk to you today of her work with the people at the border. This too is prayer, to reach out to others, to offer that experience of acceptance, love, and concern. And in other words, God's goodness. Your role here at Emmanuel is also an example of prayer. You may be the financial aid counselor, working to provide the best financial package for someone who would never have the opportunity to attend college. You may be an RA, trying to be supportive of the students in your dorm or on your floor, recognizing the need of students to be accepted and longing for connections. Just being there for one another is prayer and an example of God's goodness. Breathing out the goodness of God to the community. We all recognize the struggle of our world, our country, our cities. Prayer can help us to deal with the discourse that has become part of our everyday experience. We yearn for that centeredness that only God can bring to us. Meister Eckhart, I do work at a Dominican school, so I had to throw a Dominican in. Quote, it quoted the saying, what we plant in the soil of contemplation, we shall reap in the harvest of action. <clears throat> Before I end today, I want to share with you an opportunity to deepen your relationship with our good God. We, the Sisters of Notre Dame, are offering a busy person retreat here at Emmanuel. This is an opportunity for you, members of the Emmanuel community, to strengthen your relationship with God in the midst of your hectic lives. We will begin virtually with prayer on Monday, February 27th at 7 p.m. And then meet weekly on a weekly basis. Participants will meet individually with a sister of Notre Dame, a sister companion, to share their experiences of prayer. All these gatherings will be done virtually. I have flyers. <laughs> so please, if you're interested, join us. And this will run for the month of March. One last word of prayer from Mary Oliver. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a view or a few small stones. Just pay attention. Then patch a few words together. Don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. Let us take a moment to breathe in the goodness of God. Now let us release the breath of our good God. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Rosemary. Does anybody have any questions for Sister Rosemary? No. Yes. <laughs> you knew it was coming. Sorry, Sister Rosemary. Yeah. When I was younger, I sort of prayed to God of the vending machine. You know, if I had an issue I needed help with, a big exam coming up, it was three Hail Marys, and I hope God would help me get a good grade. So obviously there's some sort of transition to like more of a relationship. In, in your own your life, could you just highlight one or two things that kind of move the relationship? Remember, you have to grow old with me. This is <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest transitions for me was I left the congregation. I was in the congregation for maybe about three or four years and left and moved to San Antonio. And I worked as um, my first degrees in social work, as a social worker in a children's home. And I can remember, um, you know, just not knowing what to do. And, you know, when you first enter prayer, you're like, what the heck? And um, 
transportation was easier if you use public transportation in San Antonio. So I was taking a bus and I was going downtown and um, a younger homeless person got on the bus, paid his fare. And um, people started um, making fun of him right on the bus. For, the guy had done nothing, absolutely nothing. And I was such in such shock that this was happening. And I think at that point, I realized my need to be with a congregation and be with, and the belief in a, in a God that accepts all people. I was annoyed with myself that I didn't get up and do anything, you know? But um, I, I just always remember that moment that it was, you know, it was an eye opening thing for me, you know? But I'm still gonna pray for a parking <laughs> Especially Thanksgiving. <laughs> the memoraries, too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sister Mary, Mary Farron. So, Rosemary and I did not share notes, but you'll, really? you'll hear some common, uh, common analogies, I think, uh, as you listen. So, I was asked to reflect on leadership through a Notre Dame lens. And I had Rosemary's experience of don't say no to Kathy Senate, <laughs> um, primarily because I've, I've lived a long life knowing Kathy Senate, and she has said yes to me so many times. I go, so. But as I sat and thought about um, speaking here about leadership, speaking to what I expected to be an audience of students, staff, uh, in other words, people have very varied life experience. Mm -hmm. One of the first thoughts that came to me was that really my experience of leadership through a Notre Dame lens began as an experience of leadership through the Emmanuel lens. When I was a student here, uh, I was on student council. It was in the 60s. And if you haven't, for those of you who are here in Emmanuel every day, if you haven't stopped lately to look at the section on the 60s in the murals on the first floor, I'd invite you to do that. It was a time of incredible societal upheaval. And here was no different. Vatican II had just happened. And while everything seemed in chaos in the external world, here, you were invited to question, to search, to not just take easy answers, to never take the easy way out. Um, I can remember sitting at lectures in this very room where you were challenged to have what we then talked about as an informed conscience. And I think that's at the heart of being a leader, that you take seriously the responsibility to have an informed conscience that then moves you to action. It can't help do anything but that. So I've always been really, really grateful to the teachers that I had here, to my classmates, some of whom are my lifelong and closest friends, because what I learned here became foundational for all of the many years over which I've had the opportunity to develop a practical understanding of what leadership can be and what leadership can cost, because it does both. It presents blessing and challenge and cost. And that's what makes it all worth it. When I entered Notre Dame, I drew on those experiences. And imagine my surprise when after my friends who all thought it was crazy for entering, my father thought I would never last. He was sure I would be put out. <laughs> the parting words to me were, honey, if you come home, we'd be thrilled, but please don't get put out. <laughs> So imagine my surprise 
when on Sunday afternoon, barely one weekend, we have a tradition of gathering for prayer in the chapel. And we read what was then called an act of consecration, and it was based on our chapter acts of 1969. It was the first chapter that's a, an international meeting, uh, happens every six years, but it was the first one after Vatican II. So I wasn't around for the chapter itself, but the acts that came out of that, the phrase that has always stayed with me, was that we were called to be disturbers of false peace. Imagine my surprise. <laughs> I just loved that phrase. And it really has echoed in my mind through many jobs and many transitions. Uh, it sort of goes me to stand on my feet when, when Oscar was stamping his foot today and saying, you, you may be telling me to sit down, but I'm standing up. That's what Alita does. Alita stands up stands up for what they believe in, doesn't matter the position that we hold. It, it's an attitude, I think, that, that we bring to life. It's an openness. It's a willingness to listen. It's a, the understanding that there's never just one way to look at something, never. And I learned that here. I learned that through the Notre Dame influence here that truth comes in many, many ways. And it's in our common searching. It's in our trying to work together, to respectfully listen, to probe, to question, to offer your own voice, to raise questions. One of my teammates is here, so she'll appreciate the, <laughs> my compulsion to ask questions. <laughs> to push the questions until we're all able to identify an answer that moves us forward, that's values-based, that speaks to gospel living. And so this work of disturbing false peace, I think is at the heart of being a good leader. Regardless of the position that we hold, whether you're a student, faculty, senior faculty, faculty emerita, it doesn't matter. All of us are called to live honestly and deeply, not settling for false or surface peace, but digging in, listening, analyzing, seeing possibilities, offering insights, and respecting those of others. Clearly, these characteristics are in sync with the Notre Dame hallmarks. And to paraphrase our constitutions, We're called, you're called, not just we who wear the Notre Dame cross, but all of us who share in the Notre Dame tradition. We're called to enable people to develop a capacity to analyze experience, recognize goodness, and assume responsibility for shaping life according to gospel values. The search for common ground is not about settling for the least common denominator. It's about searching for the common good. And this search can itself be very disturbing. It can disturb our own peace in the beginning. It can disturb that false peace that surrounds us. It can create a little chaos. It sometimes creates a bit of tension. But if we hang in there together, we work through to the other side. And this is one of the parallels to, to Rosemary, because the image that I came up with as I thought about this, and what was it about this word disturbing false peace that I could talk to you about in terms of, and having a positive sense of what it is. And I came up with the idea of gardening. Whether it's a major field that we're planting or a small corner of the backyard, you need to till the soil, you need to disturb the soil in order to have it be receptive to the seed. You need to do that preparation work. And that's the way in which disturbing false peace leads to growth and shared values. And these are the very things that Emmanuel's mission statement and vision statements call us to. It is all of a piece. In the college's mission statement, we say, 
The college educates students in a dynamic learning community rooted in the liberal arts and sciences and shaped by strong ethical values, a commitment to social justice and service, the Catholic intellectual tradition, and the global mission of the Sisters of Notre Dame. Students who choose Emmanuel choose this as a place to develop in every respect while preparing for lives of leadership, professional achievement, global engagement, and profound purpose. Leadership is profound purpose. It's profoundly simple. It's to live as the prophet Micah puts it so succinctly. You've been told what is required of you, to do the right, to love goodness, and to walk humbly with your God. Enjoy the journey. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions for Sister Mary Farron? <laughs> you know, thinking about both spirituality and your own, you know, your personal discernment of, in life and your personal journey, and combining that with your sense of being an unwelcome disturber of the peace. You know, I frequently struggle with both of those things in my own life in terms of the institutional church and its position on women. And I think because of who we are and because of the prayer life that we share, um, not just among ourselves, but with lay women across the world, frequently, even though we are vowed religious women, we find ourselves in tension with the very institution that I think sometimes wants us to be quiet, good little girls and not to raise our voices. And so, you know, I, I think it's important for us for me to remember that being doing the things that you're talking about can sometimes lead us into positions that are very uncomfortable, not only for those that are challenging, but also for ourselves. Um, because it does feel like I shouldn't be doing this or I shouldn't be saying this, but it's like what Oscar did, you know, stamping your foot, taking your place and saying, no, you are wrong on this instance, and you are not listening to the voices of the people of God. So somehow that prayer and that leadership need to, need to give us all, whoever we are, enough strength and enough courage to do that speaking out when it's not a popular voice that anybody wants to hear. <laughs> so I just thank you for supporting all of our efforts, I think, to be those kind of women whether we're religious or whether we're students or whether we're faculty, um, to have the courage to do what our heart and soul and prayer is leading us to do, whether it's popular or not. So thank you. Sister Mary Ask McCabe. All right. This is tough. <laughs> <laughs> marvelous, marvelous messages. Thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to speak about the our immigrant ministry at the border. And I want to say right away that um, it is a collective ministry. It is many sisters and right at the moment, many of our um, co-workers, relatives, associates, students. It began with sisters, but it has grown beyond that. And I'll try to give you a little bit of the history of how it began and where we are right now. Um, I hope I'll have some time for questions because maybe we can talk about what's happening at the border at this moment in terms of policy, but I'll see if we have time for that. I'm <laughs> not sure. So um, around, this, around 2016 and 2017, an all call, an SOS went out from, from the church agencies like Catholic Charities that works along the border and um, non-governmental organizations, and they were they were noticing an unusual influx of immigrants arriving at the southern border and many were teenage boys as young as 13 they were fleeing gang warfare and the three central american countries known as the southern triangle which is um Honduras, el salvador and guatemala and the gangs were forcing recruitment of these young 
teenagers. And if they refused, their families would be threatened, killed. And um, so they, uh, the families were also targeted. So they either had to join the gang, they're called Madas or Pandillas, or they would be killed. So many grandmothers put together all their resources and gave it to their young grandsons. Many tell you that story. Get to the border of the United States, get out of here. You will not have a life if you stay here. So that they were coming. And then mothers and fathers were coming with children and um, teens who were fleeing this um, tremendous violence that they were feeling. Um, they couldn't let their children be kidnapped. Their teenage boys forced into gangs and their young daughters targeted to be gang girls. We heard stories, concrete stories from the immigrants that we were meeting that were proving that they did have the, a real fear, a real fear of this kind of persecution. So the immigrant shelters in Texas um, were packed and they were needing help to receive this influx of immigrant families seeking asylum. Um, and the, le the laws of the United States of America, both federal and international law says that a person who is feeling persecuted in their native, native country has a right by law to seek to seek peace and safety in another country. So we do have to receive asylum seekers who have grounds for seeking asylum. So we sisters of Notre Dame of the East West province, we heard that plea and our charism is to be with the most impoverished and the most abandoned places. That's what our founders, St. Julie and all of our tradition and her and her, our, our legacy as Sisters of Notre Dame, this, this is what we carry, this is what, this is our call. So we had to respond somehow. So we sent a team of four to check out the situation, do some fact finding, and we witnessed the tremendous need for help at the border, especially in McAllen, Texas, which is right, McAllen is right over the border from Reynosa and Matamoros, which are very, very violent Mexican cities. Um, and then we invited sisters across our province to join the effort for short, for short periods of time, whatever they could do. So we wrote a project and our provincial leadership team, they work as a team, <laughs> gave us all their support. Go for it, go for it. So over 35 sisters got on board with this project and at least half of them are here today. Would you please raise your hands <laughs> or stand up or do something? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking for our collective unity and force and mission as Sisters of Notre Dame. And we so we responded. We rented a trailer in McAllen and we got a province car. And for three years until the pandemic hit, we were a constant presence with immigrant families seeking asylum in the United States. And concretely, what was that like? Well, um, the, I used to the Border Patrol would bring the families to the shelters on the U.S. side. We worked what was called the Humanitarian Respite Center in McAllen, which is a Catholic Charities Respite Center. And uh, we, along with many other volunteers, and this was a beautiful part about it, we saw the force of the good hearts of American people. We were not alone. There were volunteers from all over the United States. So part of our Part of this mission was not what we were giving, it was what we were receiving. We got this not only from marvelous immigrant courageous families that were coming to save their children and give them a future, but we were also seeing the best of the United States of America. Because these volunteers came, they, um, we, had, we, we witnessed um, FedEx and, and um, they call them Amazon and whatever, <laughs> prime trucks, pouring in with donations from every city in the United States. It was a tremendous effort. Um, so that's what we saw. So we, our job was really just to welcome people. They would get off these huge white buses that, that ICE brought, um, transported them to the shelter and these big buses and they would come off, they were scared. They were fearful. They had been coming through a horrible situation in Mexico where they'd been kidnapped or raped or 
um, extorted, and they didn't know what to expect. And we were the first ones to say, welcome. Thank you why you're here. And then, then they'd smile. So that was really what we were doing. We were welcoming, smiling, and saying, you're OK. You're OK. You're safe. Um, they had ex they had come through Mexico, which is a horrendous experience, and most of the time swimming over the Rio Grande, which was dangerous, or rafting. And it was after months, many of these people had been on the road for months with small children. They had suffered extortion, kidnapping from the drug cartels, but they still came in the hope of a chance at a dignified life here in the United States. And they were coming because they had no choice. They could not go home. If they did, it was to die. They had no choice. These are the people that are coming to our board. So on reaching our shelter, that's what they, they saw. They were treated with dignity and, and a warm welcome, a smile and a hug. We could hug in those days. <laughs> Now, I'm going to give you a couple of concrete stories. Amalia, she had to flee from El Salvador with her two-age two -age daughter that were being harassed by gang members to become their gay girls. So she, they either had to accept or die, so they decided to flee. And during their long trek through Mexico, they had to hide in a safe house to escape the Mexican cartels. They wound up hiding with 10 immigrant men who they did not know but they were others on the same journey and they were scared. It was a mother and, a, and the two daughters. But one of the men was a Christian community led leader back in El Salvador. Back in El Salvador, he was a Christian community leader because the theology of liberation had done its work in all those Latin American countries. And there were many wonderful communities, Christian communities praying together. So this man every night he would um, organize a Bible service and a prayer service during the days in hiding. So Amaya told me this. She said, we all prayed together. And Amaya said, and every night I prayed aloud in a loud voice saying, thank you, God, for sending these good men who are so respectful of us <laughs> and bless them on their journey. <laughs> and they did. They did. There was never in that particular situation. I just love the story. It's one of my favorites. Another one is Lorena. She and her 13-year-old son had to flee Honduras because he was targeted for recruitment into the gangs. <laughs> they had killed her husband. So she and Carlos left for the border. In Mexico, running away from kidnappers, and they have to run, they have to run into the woods. And not only kidnappers, but the Mexican, they call them the amigas which is the Mexican immigration agents who are pretty brutal. And they're running many times, they're running to hide. Well, Lorena broke her leg. And when we saw her, she was sitting with the leg. She was not in a wheelchair. She did not have any kind of a cane or anything. And the leg was um, bent behind her. And so we tried to help her there at the shelter. And I said, how did you ever make it to the border? She said, my son carried me on his back. He was 13. And there, Eva, he was a Guatemalan. Um, and she had a relative, she was a Guatemalan of Mayan, indigenous woman. And she would come down from her mountain villages to sell her uh, tamales and other things in the marketplace. But the gangs, they target people who are making money. Like in the markets, if somebody has a little successful business, they target them and they say, we want 50 50 percent it's called renta we want this we'll protect you if you're giving them up you give if um you give us your money and um you have to give us your money or else she didn't she she refused and so they took this coal from probably from a stove and burnt her arm she showed me the burn So she had no choice to grab her little girl because they told her they knew where she's little girl was in child care. And she and the child fled that night. And when I met her, she was still traumatized. She was shaking when she was telling me this story. She was shaking. But she had to do that to save her child. 
And what we've met on the border many, many times were mothers and children. Wasn't that true? More mothers and children. Um, that was the greatest part of the population. Now, in, in 2019, that ended. All of a sudden, the shelters are empty. No more people are coming to our shelter. Why? Well, the Trump administration said no more. We don't want asylum seekers from Central America. There's too many of them. Let's find ways to deter them. Separate the kids from their parents. Make them wait in Mexico. Facing danger and kidnapping, that should force them to give up and go home. That is called the deterrent policy within the immigration policy of the United States of America at that time. And some of these deterrents have not been totally wiped away, but some of the worst ones have been in this new administration. At that time, they were terrible, terrible deterrents. MPP, which was the one wait in Mexico, it's called Migrant Protection Protocols. Is that not insidious? Protection. It was not protection. It was persecution. Um, so they were cruel and inhumane deterrents. 72,000 immigrants were forced to wait in Mexico under the protection policy of that administration. And we're seeing our shelters empty. So what are we going to do now? Well, we went out and looked for them and we found them on the other side of the border. They were all huddled around a bridge on the Matamoros side. You can walk over the bridge, we Americans, of course. We can, write, we can walk over the bridge. We'll have to have a passport to get back in. But in walking over, there they were. They could not come in anymore. And so they were all huddled around and people had begun to bring hot tents. Is that what you call them? <laughs> Camp, yeah, the little, little tents. And um, here they are in the scorching heat uh, with no, no money, no protection, but the word went out from, there's another group of marvelous volunteers in Brownsville, they're called Train Team Brownsville. And they have a, an app and they have their Facebooks and everything. And they put out all these, these um, SOSs. So volunteers from all over the US began to mobilize and bring supplies. So that's when we would see, we, uh, one of the amazing things was that groups, churches, every kind of church, every synagogue, uh, Priest, bishop, well, a couple of bishops. No, I don't think there were any bishops at that time. <laughs> I'm sorry. But there were priests and there were rabbis, okay, and there were pastors and there were sisters, and um, they were coming. And many of them belonged to organizations that would organize. It was quite amazing. They would actually prepare a hot meal for over a thousand people, and they would bring that over the border in the afternoon and those people would line up and have supper. Mm -hmm. And I, I really did not believe it until mm -hmm. I saw it. They had ways of protect of, of um, preparing the meal um, and they got people in Brownsville to, to um, uh, from, um, rent, not rent out, but loan out their ovens and they were able to prepare this. And so people had a hot meal at night many, many times. This is how they fed people. And then we, our job, because we were, <laughs> we were just like the backup crowd. Our job was to drag. How many of you drag carts over the bridge to Montevideo's? <laughs> <laughs> our job was to drag carts filled with pup tents, blankets, mattresses, diapers, food, clothes, school supplies. Anything else? Wet wipes. Even the guys wanted wet wipes because there was no water for them, to, for them to clean up. So everybody wanted wet wipes. Wet wipes. So this Montemortis refugee camp was growing and growing, and they had the tents now. People were getting the first thing they got them was tents. Um, places like Walmart were sold out. There was not a tent. There was not a blanket. There was not a mail art blanket. There was nothing left. We were buying it all. Everybody was buying it all. And bringing it over to Matamoros from Rounds, Brownsville, over the bridge to Matamoros. They were sitting there because they had been told that they would get a court date. It was a lie. They would never get a court date. So after I can remember the first group of guys who had lined up early in the morning, thinking that they were going to go over and get a court date. When they came back, they said, it's a lie. It's not going to happen. 
and they realized the United States of America was lying to them. I remember that clearly. I remember the man's face, horrible. The conditions, there were only six toilets for thousands of people, by the way. And the, and the Rio Grande is a dirty river. Mm -hmm. It's totally polluted. And they were taking baths in it until Matamoros began to truck in some water. But in the beginning, it was very terrible. Now, one of the greatest, one of the most amazing things about the Matamoros camp is that the people began to organize themselves. And they all of a sudden, you have saw these little ovens. They would go down to the edge of the river, and the mud is perfect for a, for making a little oven. So they all of them they began to have their ovens. They planted vegetable and flower gardens to make it look better. They organized cleaning crews and sports for the kids. They many of those immigrants were teachers back home. They organized schools. We brought in um, different kinds of um, school supplies. I think people here were playing games with the kids, right? Where you? Yeah. Pardon? And reading books. And reading books. Um, and, and they had a little library in the park, dragged it around the, around the um, Matamoros camp, this little um, cart library. And they had benches and shelves that they made from wood around there from a park that was adjacent and from old, any carton that we had that we brought, they wanted the carton because they could make furniture out of that. So their little tents all of a sudden had a little cart, had a little shelf in it made out of a carton and they had their they had their clothes or whatever in that little carton. So they knew how to take care of themselves. They organized security crews because the, the cartels were hovering around. And at night, they would come in and they kidnapped the kids. So they had to organize their own security forces and they did it. The El Salvadorans one night, the Hondurans another night, the, uh, the Cubans another night. There were quite a few Cubans there. And an interesting thing about the Cubans is they come, many of them are doctors, but they're immigrants trying to get out. And so they worked as volunteers with the global management who was running the health clinic and they came and did, it's like Doctors Without Borders came to the, to the, um, to that camp. And we also had um, pro, a lot of pro bono lawyers and they were helping people fill out asylum applications. So in those two years, we witnessed the meeting of good, a lot of good, a lot of force, political, um, um, a lot of positive force, as I've already described, and also the evil side, which was the cruelty of the policies, the deterrence, the ranting and raving about with a racist content against black and brown people. That's what they were meeting and hearing. They were hearing this and inciting hate and racism at the same time against immigrants because maybe they're not white, white enough. And all the horrific danger that was awaiting them on when they had to wait on the Mexican side. So we saw the evil and we saw the good. And then the pandemic hit, so we could not go into the camp anymore. The camp was close to volunteers, and I will tell you something you probably won't believe. That global management, which was the health team, closed the camp down. They had a field hospital built, and there were no COVID deaths in Matamoros for the whole pandemic. Oh. Isn't that amazing? God is good. Yeah. All the time. Okay. So now the COVID, after the, um, our volunteer service then ended because we could not go into the camp and they, everybody was on the other side. So we couldn't do any more. So uh, after the pandemic, then uh, we have a new site. It's in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, uh, we are now, um, sir, we are working at what's called the um, International Rescue Committee has a welcome center right down street from a house that we have there so sisters are going associates students co-workers you are all invited <laughs> we need volunteers and it's an easy process and all you have to do is get yourself there and even if 
That's so good. No, because you don't have any expenditure once you get there. But some people say, I can't go, I can't pay this place, pay this passage. We get donations, we'd help. We would help people get there, especially students or people who wouldn't have them a way of, of getting themselves out to Phoenix. We would find a way. We have to find a way. There's money everywhere. We know there's money. We just got to find it. <laughs> we got to know. So that's that. So much money. Okay, I, I have to stop now because of this. we're almost at the end and there might be some questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. sign up. Does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, in 2019, we went to uh, seven students I said probably through El Paso because in, in August of 2019, as a consequence of that, there was a shooting in Loma. Uh, and the, the shooter was actually targeting a lot of people who were brown and black people. And we went with uh, the students on, on Business People Day, seven students, and we actually went over the border to Juarez. What is and we brought people over, uh, the whole, whole bunch of people from, uh, from the church. Uh, and we came back on, on the other side. So we, we saw that we volunteered a couple of days. So it, was, it was pretty incredible. And um, you were right, you're right, just some, the money was there. You know, the, the community had really helped out. And, yeah, yeah. and we, we went, otherwise, we couldn't get the funding any other way to do it. So what do you do? Incredible. I went to El Paso early on when I got back from Brazil. I was trying to figure out what to do. And I kept going down to the border and looking at different places. And in El Paso, I was working in, um, did you meet Ruben Garcia? He's the one that yes. organizes a marvelous man. And he he had a whole bunch of shelters going. And I was in one of them. And all of a sudden, this car pulls up a truck, sort of, a, you know, a, a SUV, I guess, I guess they call it. And a woman got down. She said, I've come for the dirt, for the laundry. I'll take the laundry that's dirty. Because they they were giving sheets and towels and everything to the immigrants there. And I she's. I said, well, let's go find it. So we opened the dirty laundry room and it's filled with many big, huge bags of dirty laundry. And I said, how, are you gonna, how many are you going to take? It? She said, all of them. I said, how? She said, she was Mormon. Um, she said, I take them down to our, our church, our temple, and tomorrow the women will come and we'll divide it up and they'll take it home and tomorrow you'll have it all clean. Right. Bags and bags of dirty laundry. That's what the Mormons were doing, and they do it in various places of the border. They do that's one of their contributions. That's the Mormon Church. I thought that was a great story. The but the Bishop of El Paso is a marvelous man, Mark Seats. He closed the seminary because he said, I think it's better to put the immigrants in there than the seminary. <laughs> I love that. I, he, I, I, I find uh, every time he right now another thing with he the bishops' conference, which doesn't always get things right, got one thing right. They made him the bishop of the immigration pastoral of the United States of America. Now that is a good thing. That's really a reason to hold. I'd like to follow up. Uh, thank you. We're all so inspiring. Uh, Dr. Van Bakkes as well. Um, I, can you give an idea of what people would be doing or could be doing in Phoenix? Um, let's say our students went for a week at a time or whatever. What, what would they be able to do? Well, we, the way we, the program is set up now, we, um, we you enter into communication with us. We see what the situation is and how many are. We have two houses that, that one of them, they're, they're habitat houses. So we can, and with young people, we really can get a lot of people into a small house, you know, because you can just um, create um, sleeping space that would like, with us old girls, it's a little <laughs> difficult. <laughs> okay, but, um, and then you go to the, uh, the IRC Welcome Center, which is a 10 minute drive from where we live. So people, we get people down there, and then they're on the schedule, and then they would work. They would they, they would be, be working right there where the immigrants are bussed in by ice every day. Now, how that's going to look in the next couple of weeks, 
we have to, everything is in movement right now in immigration policy, and they're doing everything possible to keep people out. And I mean, that's a big subject on, unto itself, and I don't think we even have time to talk about it, but um, the numbers, the last time we've been there, a couple of you have been there recently, right, Gary and Rita, yeah, okay. Um, you see immigrants from Russia, Georgia, Peru, Ecuador, Nicaragua, lots of them, Venezuela, they're trying to keep the Venezuelans because mm -hmm. they're coming in by the thousands. And um, the Haitians are trying to get in and don't, they're not letting them in. And um, in Cuba. So there's this new government policy called the Customs Border Patrol One app. And I'm not gonna, and if they just did this last mm -hmm. week, but I'm just gonna tell you something about this, particularly because it's, it's um, National Black History Week. For people to, the, the four nations, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuelans, and Haitians can use the app and in order to request exemption from Title 42. Title 42 is, is a policy that Trump used and it was resurrected from 1944. It's a, it's, a, it's a public health policy that says the government can say, go home because you're a, you're a health risk. You cannot come into our country. It is only used on the southern border. Is this racist? Mm -hmm. Go to Canada, find out if they're yeah. using it. They're not. Go to any airport, doesn't work. They only use it at the southern border. The only place they use Title 42 to say that you know, we might bring, be, be bringing in COVID risks is at the southern border. Any other border or airport is not under the same. So there are these little things that you begin to discover. Another thing, to, in order to access this app, they translated English, Spanish, not Creole. They forgot that the Haitians do not speak Spanish. It's not in Creole. The, the Haitians have a right to use it, but can't use it because it's not in Creole. What's that? You know, it's systemic racism. There's people that are setting these things up that don't even think about who's who and and what's going on. So even this kind of thing is geared to white people. Worse, you have to have facial recognition to access the app. Facial recognition, I think, does anybody know anything? I just discovered this last couple of days. Facial recognition, you know, that, um, only works on white faces 100%. It doesn't work on black and brown faces. There are many, many errors. That's why some black person gets picked up and put in jail because he looks like somebody else. There's a lot on the, there's a lot about facial recognition error. It is not, it's a technician that is very faulty. The immigrants, how are they gonna use this? And, all right, you got money. You can go to a hotel You can that has Wi-Fi and you can use your little smartphone and you can apply to get into the United States. But if you're in a shelter with a thousand people and there's one phone connector and your phone battery's running out, how do you do that? So the whole process is again vulnerable people. It's the whole process that they've set up in order to say they're doing something. Favors, favors one class over another another it's very sad so that that's just what's happening right this minute and there's a lot in the papers i picked this up from the washington post i didn't have to go any farther they're covering it thank you sir sister yeah. mary alice we really appreciate everything that you bring and you know, obviously we have a wealth of resources that are sitting on this panel before us and if this speaks to you we want to make sure that you take time to learn about it now and part of social justice is knowing what's going on in the world and making sure that nothing passes us by because we're you never know what's a call to action for you. 
and we thank you so much for being here. So please, if you have, we can get Sister Mary Alice's contact information. So we can definitely have that. We'll have it in Mission Ministry. And if you ever want to yeah, connect, we can do that through our office. So we want to say thank you so much to our panelists. We have one more sister here today, Sister um, Isabel, who's in the back, yeah. who also we could just want to say hello to. She just has joined us. She is working. She's be about to begin her tenure at the United Nations. So also another form in order to have some great information. So perhaps you can also speak with her as we end today's panel. Um, she can come, if you don't mind, just coming down in front. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, but we are truly honored to have these sisters in front of us. We thank you so much for all that you do and for joining us today to celebrate the wealth of the Sisters of Notre Dame and what they can bring to the world. So thank you.